good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Thank you very much to join us for the first Industrial Talk of 2021. So it's a pleasure to have here today Alan Wong and Julio Leão from Insilica UK and Insilica Brazil. So uh, thank you very much for to Alan and to Julio to accept uh, the invitation to start uh, the 2021 uh, series of uh, uh, industrial talks. So uh, Alan Wong is uh, director of engineering at Insilica based near Oxford in UK. He has been designing RF anal analog and mixed signal silicon circuits and system since the 98 with special focus on low power consumption and high integration for wireless transceivers, SOCs for cellular, uh, WLAN, WPAN, digital broadcast and satellite communications. He graduated from University of Oxford, UK, and he's senior member of IEEE and served on the technical program committee of uh, ISSCC. So thank you very much, Alan, to accepted the invitation to start the 2021 series of industrial talks and uh, the floor is with you to start your presentation you are muted Alan. that always happens <laughs> no, thank you for that kind uh, introduction there ricardo yeah. so yes i'm here to talk about uh, I don't think I'm on mute. Is it okay? Is it's it coming okay. across okay? Yeah. It's okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So I've got other colleagues in my office who are also listening in. So they are they are giving me waves as I'm talking. So, um, but yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, enabling the next generation of always connected cars, and specifically about KA band electronically steerable flat pan antenna solutions. So I think um, let's go to the next slide. So the abstract is lots of words, and maybe you read it in the, in the notice for this presentation. But the key thing is that the CASIS project stands for Connected Automotive Satellite Served Integrated System. And it's a UK project that aims to provide, um, to put the UK connected vehicle supply chain at the forefront of satellite communications. So using UK te technology, we can tap into the $160 billion market for mobile satellite terminals and payload technologies. So that's what the aim of this kind of industrial stroke research project is for. So the outline of my talk is I'll again briefly discuss the CASIS uh, project, then I'll move on to talking about satellite communications in general, and then focus a bit more on phased arrays and why we're doing them. And then I'll have a section where I'll talk about in silica's involvement in developing a millimeter wave ASIC, specifically for KA band steerable antennas. Then in that section, I'll talk about the architecture, some implementation, trade-offs, and some silicon measurement results. And then I'll draw some conclusions. So the motivation for this work is always on connectivity for automotive applications. So in 2020, um, you know, cellular covered 63% of the world's population, but only 30% of the 37% of the world's landmass. So how do you achieve always on connectivity anywhere? That's with satellite communications. So uh, uh, this is the kind of the crux of this discussion. So in terms of the CASIS project, what the CASIS project is, it's this test bed on the left-hand side when we have an information CPU information control of the of the car. It's got display drivers, sensors, GPS, a Wi-Fi module, cellular communications. It's, there's other stuff on the car in terms of sensors for lidars, radars, and for, so, but from this hub, what we're intending to do on this is to add a um, satellite terminal module. So in the satellite, satellite terminal module, we have a modem, and then we have our RF module. And that RF module is the one that provides the link from the car to the satellite. So on the right hand side, we've got a this RF module is like split out. And inside it, we've got digital chips, PLLs, power management, lots of little antennas, these blue things, and then an RF chip in an array that kind of uh, configures all these antennas, drives them, receives from them to make this link work. 
So what we're trying to do is provide always on internet data connectivity for the car. Here's like a mock-up of what the original project was trying to achieve. It's going to be like on the roof of the car, flat panel um, for the satellite communication. So um, that's the aim of what we're trying to do. So just taking a step back, let's talk a little bit about satellite communications in general. So the first thing is just get a, an idea of the, where these satellites are. So if we're, if we're on the Earth here, and this is Everest, is that kind of, that kind of tall in the troposphere, we've got clouds and weather here. Just above the weather is you have something called high altitude platforms. These are like kites uh, or a solar powered, a tethered, they could be tethered. And I think Facebook were doing this for a couple of years ago. And that's again for providing some sort of internet base station up there. And then we've got the metasphere, that's where you see shooting stars, and that's where they burn up. And then outside of that, you get the first line of satellites, which are low Earth orbit satellites called LEO about a thousand kilometers above the surface and then you get kind of in 36,000 kilometers above the surface you get the geo satellites they're the geostationary satellites so their position is always fixed above a single point on the world world's surface and so they rotate at the same speed as the earth and this is to give you some context to this um jeff bezos i think he was in the news yesterday that he went up to space in his blue origin he got that high kind of above the high altitudes above the shooting stars, but not quite to where the Leos are, or close to where the Leos are. And then he came back down again. <laughs> so um, that gives you an idea of the kind of uh, communication that we're trying to close. So if we draw that to scale here, we have the Earth at 12,000 kilometers wide, and then kind of 36,000 kilometers away, we have the geosatellite. And the geosatellite, as I said, has a zero kilometers per second speed in relation to the Earth's rotation. So it's always staying over the same point. And so what you notice from this is, firstly, with a very small kind of beam angle, you can cover quite a lot of the world's surface from this satellite. But as you come in and closer and closer and closer, the speed of the satellites to maintain the orbit starts to increase. So what it ends up being is that the closer you are, the faster you have to rotate around to keep the orbit. So at LEO, low Earth orbit satellites, which are about 1,000 kilometers above the surface, you know, they're traveling around the Earth orbiting maybe 20, 30, 40 times a day. So if you're on this world surface, they'll go across the sky in a, in a matter of an hour or two, and then they'll be out of, the, out of view. So if you're trying to communicate with Leo, then you clearly have to be able to steer and track them as they go across the sky. Uh, and I've put, put on here, this is the GPS satellites. They're kind of like a medium Earth orbit, but they're not, they're not really data. They're just giving time signals for GPS and um, you know, not suitable for kind of data communications that we're trying to achieve. So satellite opportunities. So this is from McKinsey and company. I, I Google searched uh, this and McKinsey said this in 2020, you know, converging forces of, that could create new opportunities for low Earth orbit satellites, technology advances, new business models, more funding from tech companies and investors, greater demand for bandwidth and low latency across the world. So that gives greater opportunities for constellation providers. So the guys who are going to spend money putting up the satellites and only if they can bring the cost down. So the, you know, the key sentence at the end there is the cost. So if the cost makes sense, it will happen. And it's already happening as people may know from uh, if they read the news on these kind of companies like Amazon and so forth. So in terms of technology though, the, the key driver has been the technology and the technology has been able to achieve Silicon chips, for example, that can operate at higher frequencies. It's technology that allows us to design uh, satellite payloads, either the things, the electronics that go in the satellite, which are much more sophisticated and high functioning. And also in terms of engineering in general, sending these uh, low of orbit satellites, that's getting low and lower cost to do. So if all those things combined together, we end up with getting increased bandwidth and higher data capacities. And those things all ultimately result in lower cost per bit. So in this bottom left-hand side, we've got a graph of available terabits per second against year. And you can see year on year, the, the amount of data capacity in satellite is going up and up. And driven from about 2018 by the gray section, which is LEO, that's the lower of orbit satellites. Having said that, GEO is still growing. That's the geostationary satellites, and they're the bigger satellites further away. And that's still growing year on year. And as we mentioned in terms of bandwidth, you know, the old satellites, or L-band is used for kind of GPS and satellite TV, maybe in S-band. But for these kind of communications that we're trying to achieve now, you know, the frequency is going up and up. The first deployment of Starlink 
from Amazon. That's at KU Band. And they've K, all the big players have already allocated from FCC, KU band frequency allocations, um, and bandwidth al orbits, shall, shall I say, and K band and V band. And I think some of them have even gone to E band, which is kind of 60 to 90 gigahertz already. But I think in terms of first deployments to KU, the next generation is going to be KA and then going up from there. So the mega constellations, as of the 1st of May, uh, this year, there were 7,400 satellites going around the Earth, man-made, sent by, I think there were about 11,000 have been sent, and about 4,000 have kind of either blown up, disintegrated, or uh, out of, or gone out of orbit, basically. But if you read the news, Starlink, uh, Elon Musk's company, he's going to be sending thousands of thousands of satellites himself. He's already got a few up there already. Um, and and that, as I said, they're in KU band at the moment. There's his nemesis from Amazon, uh, Jeff Bezos. He's doing uh, Kuiper. That's already allocated KU. Actually, it's focusing on KA band, actually, that one. There's OneWeb, which is uh, part owned by the UK government. There's Canadian Lightspeed from Telesat. That's also sending about 1,000 satellites. And then a couple of months ago, the Chinese also announced a 13,000 satellite constellation that they're going to send. So this number, 7,000, is going to grow massively very quickly, like I showed on the previous slide. The, 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 data, the data capacity of LEO is just going to go up exponentially. So we're trying to tap into that. But obviously, it's not easy doing satellite communications, although these guys make it razzmatazz. You know, the, the, the big difficulty is kind of link budgets. You know, these things are far away. I th I, we showed the LEO, the GEO uh, link budget is 36,000 km kilometers away. You know, that's a light speed latency of like a quarter of a second backwards and forwards. With the LEO satellites, it's a little bit closer, but it still they've got problems. Uh, it's still far away. It's still not like talking to your cellular base station at home uh, on the ground. But uh, so generally, in terms of a link budget, you know, you come in with a signal level on the earth side for the transmitter. You kind of amplify it. You drive it for a power amplifier. You get some losses in the connections. You have an antenna, and then that's up in. Then you have some weather, local weather. Then you have a long path loss because the satellite's far, far away. And then on the satellite, you have another antenna and more amplification, a few more losses in, on the satellite, and then you have a satellite antenna. And then the downlink is where the satellite's going back to Earth. Again, you get a huge path loss, some weather, local weather. Then you get again locally on the ground. You have a, a huge antenna gain low noise amplifiers, down converters, you get back to the same signal as you started. So that's closing the link budget in terms of signal level. So how's that done in practice? Well, it's done by, by having huge antenna gains and therefore antenna directivity. And that's typically done with these dishes, as everybody knows. But as frequencies are going up, as I mentioned before, it means that um, electrically large apertures are actually becoming small in form factor. So you, if the frequency goes up, you can get the same kind of capture of electromagnetic waves of that frequency with a smaller form factor. So that's really good. And then you get better throughput. On the downside, of course, weather is more difficult and there are other things that, are, that create challenges. But in general terms, it's all good news. So specifically for automotive, which is what we're trying to do, you know, steering is really important because if you have a satellite, satellite dish or a satellite communication on the top of the car, the car is always turning and changing direction. Also, it's actually got uh, inclination up and down. You know, the roads, there's pitch and roll as the car goes along. Roads are not flat. The undulation is due to the suspension of the car and bouncy surfaces. It's also in motion, so you get Doppler shifts. So all these things are challenges for automotive satellite links. So clearly, if you think about it on a car and you've got a beam pointing parabolic dish, Having to steer that mechanically as you turn, that's going to be very difficult. So really, it needs to be electronically steered. And you know, most people know electronically steered things means phased arrays. Uh, electronic phased arrays, you know, they can be fat panels. You can get a lot of data for each, each element. Or you can do lots of algorithm work where you can feed in the car sensing information from gyros and accelerometers, dead reckoning from GPS. All these kind of things can feed in to point the keep track of the antennas as, as they're moving across the sky and as the car is turning key thing is it's got to be low power and low cost. Otherwise, it won't get any penetration in the market. And because it's automotive, it has to be high quality. So chip qualifications and reliability is very tough for automotive. So it has to have 
different standards, safety features, and have a more rigorous qualification process than normal consumer electronics. So how do we how do we tackle these kind of phased arrays in ICs? Well, the first thing I'd say is phased arrays are not new. Uh, phased arrays have been around is, since the 1930s, I think was the first demonstration of a phased array, but that was at 18 megahertz. And so it was kind of big and clunky and huge. But even Gordon Moore uh, from Moore's Law in his, his Moore's Law paper in 1965, where he, you know, he postulated the, you know, the number of transistors are going up logarith logarithmically or doubling every year or 18 months. In that same paper, he actually said these words. He said that even in the microwave arena, we're going to get more electronics on integration silicon. And the successful realization of such items such as electronic phased arrays using a multiplicity of integrated microwave power sources could completely revolutionize radar. Now, he got it 90% right. You know, radar, we could swap that for kind of uh, phased array communication, but it's the same principle. So, you know, Gordon Moore was, he knew his stuff, should we say. So what about phased arrays? So phased arrays work um, by, so here we've got a couple of uh, antennas and we've got a wavefront that's incident at some angle phi. So as the wavefront comes along, it hits this first antenna at this point, but it's still got a little bit of distance to travel to this one. And it's delta x. And that distance, um, you know, if you do speed equals distance over time or the time delay for that distance uh, with the speed of light is this equation here. And if you take the angle of phi, you find that the relative delay of this wavefront to so these uh, D spaced antenna is a, this function here. So it's just a function of the angle of incidence and the spacing of these antennas. So how you deal with that, if you take each of these elements of these antennas and you add a delay to it, then if you would align these delays to let's say the delay in arrival, you can make all these things constructively interfere so that we get a big signal here. So if it arrives here first, you need to delay it longer to wait for this guy to arrive here, and then you get that. So, and this only works at that angle phi. Because if you're coming from a different angle, because the delays have been set for this angle phi, you would get kind of random construction and you kind of, it doesn't actually beam form or you don't get a special filter, you end up with uh, low. So that's really good. This is how we get the receive gain in a phased array. We talk about transmit side. So on transmit side, we have the same signal we're trying to transmit. We're going to feed it into multiple elements. If we fed it all at the same time, it would just come out bore sight straight across here. But if now we do that same delay trick, we can delay this guy with respect to this guy and do it in a linear fashion to cut. If the D spacing is linear, we end up pointing in a certain a particular direction. And that ends up being looking like a beam pattern. So that's the main bore sight now because we've got this delay in. And then we've got these other kind of different uh, antenna gains in different directions. So effectively, the effectively radiated power is n squared times a single element. So it's n squared because we've got n lots of them. So there's n. And then there's a directivity factor, which is, makes it n squared. And assuming the efficiency um, of uh, this character here, and the DC power of uh, fixed for each one, then the actual efficiency of the phased array improves n times compared to them all on their own, where they're not being beam formed. So in some way, you know, we need to generate variable delays, or I'll talk about a little bit more. We can do that with phase shifters in each element. If we do that, we can make electronic delay and cause beam forming and scanning of this uh, beam. An N element array for receiver improves the SNR by N times and improves the uh, effective isotropic radiated power N squared times versus a single element. But, you know, these things actually happen with a, with a, a power wallet dish, you know, you've got a thing and you're, you're focusing, you're doing the same job. So when you compare a, a flat panel phase away compared to a dish, actually the difference is actually the electronic beam steering only and the fact that it's like you can make it into a flat shape. So um, yeah, all these things occur in normal dishes. So when we build these phased arrays, there's multiple ways of doing it. And there's lots of phased arrays architectures. And uh, as a summary, I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, the thing I just showed before is like an RF beam forming where you put the phase or the, we put the delay in the RF path. So this gives you the true spatial filtering at the front end. And this is before, norm, normally these systems are operating at a carry at high frequency. And so there's no conversion in frequency to a, a, a baseband or IF. So this is true RF beam forming. So there's no complex LO distribution. It's the lowest area in power. 
but you've got to put the phase shift in the RF. So it's got, it's in the signal path, it's got to have its constraints on its bandwidth and its noise and its linearity. Other methods of doing it, uh, IF beam forming. So now you take the RF signals, you down convert them with a local oscillator to an IF. And then at IF, you start doing the beam forming. So in this case now, this beam form is easier to do, this phase shifter or time delay is easy to implement in silicon. So that's a good tick, but it's after the mixes. So you, you have to have these LS distribution everywhere. These mixes have to be in every chip. In, sorry, in every element. So it's larger in area and power. And it's more susceptible to interference because actually the beam form is happening at IF. So you don't get the same spatial filter and when converted to the RF because you get pattern, you get repeat patterns because of the yellow. Another option is LO beam forming, where now the phase shift is you put a mix in every path and then you put the variable time delay in the LO. So that's quite good in the respect for this phase shifter again, because it's been done at the LO, so it's got a reduced bandwidth issue because the LO is a fixed frequency. So it's easier to implement than this phase shifter. But again, you need multiple mixes, a difficult LO distribution. And again, it's going to be susceptible interferers because the special filtering is not happening here. And then you've got pure digital beam forming. So now what you to each element, you just down convert it, you put it for a data converter and you go straight into digital. So now the analog is, you know, you could say relatively straightforward, there's no phase shifters in it. The beam is formed by weighting each of these paths digitally. So now you can choose how you weight them uh, quickly and maybe more flexibly. You can split the beams, you can do lots of things digitally. Downsizes, now you need a mix of an ADC in each one of these paths. And the other distribution again is difficult like the previous these previous two. It's larger in area and power in general. And again, it's more susceptible to interference. So you, again, you don't get that space Spatial, uh, spectral shape at the front here, spatial shape at the front. So what's the best solution? Well, it depends on who you talk to. Different companies are doing it different ways. But in our situation, we, you know, we're going for a hybrid beam forming approach. We're just trying to take the best of both worlds. We're trying to do a bit RF beam forming at the front. So we do quite a number of uh, classical uh, analog beam forming where we take the RF, we put the phase shifters right at the RF. Then we sum, and then we sum a number of these elements together before we go to an RF chain. So we have a, basically a subarray. But then we do have multiple subarrays, so the, the, there's lots of digital paths, multiple digital ADC uh, data converters into the digital beamformer, so you can also do some digital beamforming as well. So it's a compromise between both. As I mentioned before, closing a link budget for a satellite is not easy. And um, I, I'm going to go through a couple of examples where we try to do that for KA band. And so in this case, we're modeling the weather patterns and the atmospheric absorption of KA band, all these kind of things are based in this model. So, and we're trying to close a link budget to a geo satellite. And in this example, it's to high last two or four. These are two high throughput satellites, which uh, high last two has been up there since about 2013. High last four has been up there since I think uh, three or four years ago. Uh, they're both KA band satellites. So um, it's a real, a problem that we can have we, real performance parameters on here. We know what we're trying to achieve. And I would say that a closing a Leo budget, a, a geo budget is much easier than closing a Leo budget. Um, but it's not necessarily due to the fact that the distance is, is much shorter to Leo, because that's normally compensated by the fact that the geo satellites have better antennas and they're bigger, more power. But rather it's a result of the better power flux density that can be achieved with Leo and the increased satellite separation of the Leo, con the Leo satellites in the sky, which makes the adjacent uh, kind of satellite interference lower and therefore you can have a reduced uh, off-axis mask and therefore the LEO link budgets are easier to close. Now this satellite has a kind of uh, DVB-S2X uh, uh, modulation for the uh, terminal receive and a DVB-RCS2 uh, modulation for the terminal transmit. So in these kind of uh, standards, it's like most digital uh, wireless standards, you can trade link margin for data throughput. So if the conditions are good, you can have a better uh, data throughput. When conditions are bad, you kind of ratchet it down with kind of uh, uh, you know, digital coding, uh, different modcon, so that you kind of get a better link margin. So when we try and close that link budget to this uh, high last two satellite 36,000 kilo uh, 36, kilometers away, we can close it with a, uh, a 784 uh, receive elements. So that's uh, antenna patches, circular, circular patches about that big each. And they fit into a kind of A4 size piece of paper. And if each one of those 
uh, elements has a uh, electronics on it, which has a 3 dB noise figure. Then we get a kind of gain to uh, temperature uh, uh, figure of merit, 6.4 dB. That's kind of like a, a satellite speak for SNR, if you like, or kind of uh, the quality of the receiver. But with that 6.4 dB um, gain to tem uh, noise to temperature ratio, that can achieve probably about a, a 0.7 bits per second per hertz uh, data throughput. Um, using the DVB-S2X standard. So, you know, if you had a, on a 50 megahertz channel, then you'd be putting like maybe 40 megabits through that. Um, the channels are uh, programmable on these satellites. You can, you, you, you pay your money and you take your, take your choice kind of thing. But, but if you make the elements bigger, of course, uh, the number of elements bigger, then you can get a better uh, G upon T and therefore better uh, uh, data throughput. Likewise, if you reduce the noise figure of each of these uh, elements, electronic elements that we're trying to achieve, then again, you can also get a better G upon T. So again, a better throughput. So this graph here shows kind of like the normalized gain of uh, an antenna pointing at, uh, I think I didn't show it on the previous slide. Let me just go back. So here, like I, I've I showed a car, I think where most of the audience is in Brazil. So I've kind of drawn it driving on Brazil. And then uh, this is the Zenith, there's a normalized angle. So we've got theta. This is the Zenith or this kind of scan angle. And that's where, the, in this case, a geosatellite, which is kind of near uh, the equator. So that's the angle that we are kind of going to point to. And then we've got an azimuth angle. We obviously, the car could be turning in any direction. And we have to, and that's the thigh angle. So based on those two angles, you know, we're pointing at 50 degrees in, in theta. So that's our main gain. We've got some side lobes, some one, a big one out here, but, you know, also ones that are local. So then if we look at this graph here, where we've got the, the kind of ele the zenith angle, the elevation angle here, we want to point at 50 degrees there. And that's the gain. The maximum gain and this is the phi and then with electronics uh, beam steering we can steer this across this across 360 degrees but if we point it here we can see even that we've got some interference pattern so we've got some responses at different locations so if there was a uh, another satellite here then we'd receive that to some extent based on these kind of side lobes so that's a a, a feature of these electronic steerable antennas what well, unwanted feature so i'll say if now we turn this around at transmit, and now this time we're transmitting at uh, uh, 30 gigahertz because on uh, the terminal transmit for K band is at that frequency. We do the same thing, but this time let's do 576 elements in the array. That on transmit side, we kind of, uh, the figure of merit for these satellite dishes is kind of like effective isotropic radiative power. So the higher this number here, kind of the more power you have available or with that kind of trade-off of a link budget to data rate, you can improve your data rate basically, and improve your bandwidth. So as we we can we can improve this power and this bandwidth by increasing the number of elements. Of course, of course, we could. In this case, we're showing that each element is driven by seven dBm from the uh, the electronics that are driving that little circle patch antenna. If we that increase the uh, power per patch instead, we could get the same effect where we can increase the IERIP and therefore increase the data throughput and we can increase the bandwidth further. So this here shows again where we're pointing at 50 degrees up, and this, the blue line shows the kind of, if we, in a clear day, if we went at maximum power, we'd be transmitting like that. But obviously transmissions are kind of regulated, and so you can't just transmit anything anywhere because FCC and uh, Etsy in Europe and various other bodies make sure that you limit it to keep the kind of inter, uh, interference to other systems low. So what we have is an off-axis mask, which is kind of shown here. So if you're going to point at 50 degrees, then you're allowed to point that yellow dot there. But around it, you kind of got to have a low emission. Maybe a bit further away, you can have a bit of a higher emission. So that's the mass we've got to achieve. If we do this thing at 30, at this kind of power level and transmit, then we end up with this kind of pattern across the sky. So we're kind of, yes, our main beam is here, but we've got all these side lobes. So how we deal with that is we have to back off. So we normally, in, in sunny conditions or good weather conditions, we back off the, the, the chip power so that we meet the masks. So this is the violation. And then when we meet the mask, we end up actually transmitting this in practice. And this is uh, adhering to the Etsy mask. It's this mask which is generally uh, sets the link budget for these things. OK, so I think just an example beam pattern. If we have a circular patch antenna, it looks kind of like that on its own. And it's, we took four of these in you know, a kind of like a regular way, then we get a kind of fat lobe. There's not much gain in it, but you see something happening. If then we extend it to like that 24 by 24 I showed for the transmitter, we get this much more gain. 
but as with much more gain, it's much more pointy. So it's much more directive. So that's not, you know, that's really where it becomes important when you've got these high uh, gain antennas, you've got to make sure that they're pointing in the right direction, otherwise you'll lose the signal. So that's where the tracking and all these algorithms come in into play to make sure these phase arrays work. So anyway, that's the kind of introduction to the uh, what we're trying to achieve. And what we've done in this project, we generated a custom KA band transceiver. So it's got four receive paths operating at 17 to 20 gigahertz. It's got four transmit paths operating at 27.5 uh, to 30 gigahertz. For this application, um, the lower part of each of the RX and TX frequency spectrums is allocated for a, a lower of orbit uh, LEO service. And the upper part of the spectrums is, uh, was allocated for a GEO service. So each RX path has an LNA with kind of gain steps in it and a five bit phase shifter. Um, they're all combined on chip, go to a IQ down conversion mixer, or they're available as a combined uh, uh, K band output for analog beamforming, RF beamforming. But after the down converter, we've got an IF uh, uh, mix, uh, amplifiers, correction, filters, and we can drive off chip. This bandwidth is about 300 odd megahertz, which translates to about 600 megahertz at the RF. On transmit, we have PAs, uh, which uh, go up to about 10 dBm. We've got a five bit phase shifter ahead of each for these PAs. So this is the RF beamforming part. We've got a, a, a signal coming from baseband that we up convert with an IQ single sideband modulator and then split to drive all these elements. These two mixes on RX and TX are driven by on-chip LO generation from an LO doubler and LO tripler. So if this is 20 gigahertz operation, and this is 30 gigahertz operation. We come in at an LO at 10 gigahertz, so, so we can clock these mixes. As well on this chip, we've got um, power detectors on each of these PAs, so we can measure their power, instantaneous power at any one time. With these power detectors, we've got temperature sensor on chip, we've got built-in self-test. These are all multiplexed into a, a kind of a monitoring ADC, which is constantly going around the chip to make sure it's all in good health and what's happening. And that feeds into a, a, kind, of a, fun, a kind of pretty a decent sized uh, digital logic section so that um, we can really um, program lots of these chips in parallel and track uh, the beams as they go, these satellites as they go across the sky. So when we, we decide to do this chip, what are we, how are we gonna do it? So we've got various technologies we can choose. We can choose the all microwave stuff in the past was Gallium 3.5 uh, technology, Gallium and Arsenide traditionally, Gallium Nitride uh, possibly these days. Great RF performance, great noise figure. Great output power, but low integration and high cost. So we couldn't use that because we couldn't really do any much digital on that chip. And because these KA band uh, antennas are very small, we can't really afford to have a separate PA and LNA in gas and then a separate RF chip. There's just no space to put them on the array. So we really want something that's integrated. It's going to have all the RF and all the digital together. So the next option is silicon germanium by CMOS stuff. Uh, so it's good RF performance. It's got medium integration, medium cost. There's bulk standard CMOS. You know, it's moderate RF performance, moderate noise figure, high integration, and the lowest cost. And then we've got now more recently. There's been CMOS SOI, so that's a good RF performance, good noise figure, moderate output powers, high integration like CMOS, medium cost, a bit more expensive than CMOS. So what we did is we kind of did a comparison of these for our chips that we we're trying to design. So we we took some circuits, we designed them in free technologies, we did some a kind of uh, technically uh, horse trading to see which is the best. So if we, if I take three representative examples, so we take uh, silicon by CMOS, uh, standard CMOS and RF, SOI CMOS. Uh, wafer sizes generally for these guys are smaller. They're kind of eight inch wafers, not 12 inch wafers. Now in terms of performance, FT, which is the uh, current gain, uh, the frequency at which the current gain of the transistor, N transistor in this case goes to unity. You can see it's they're all above 200 gigahertz. So that means if you're, that's unity. So if you want to operate uh, kind of a, a decade backed off from that, so have 20 dBs of gain, you could get 20 dBs again at about 20 gigahertz. And we're trying to design it 20 and 30 gigahertz. So that's good. So all of these could do that. Uh, in terms of F max, which is the maximum power gain, well, the power gain goes to unity. Again, that's a 200, 300 megahertz, uh, a gigahertz, sorry. There is a benefit in the SOI, of course, and um, more gain is available. So. All these technologies can do it, some slightly better than others. But then we look at cost, because I said at the beginning, cost is the most important. So cost in terms of manufacturing, doing the full masks, and that's the NRE cost that you have to do for the design, uh, for buying of the, the, the masks, sorry. So if I normalize that as X for CMOS, for silicon germanium by CMOS, the lithographies are normally smaller, I mean, 
bigger lithographies in the CMOS part. So it's normally cheaper to get those buy those masks. And if I take an IFRS SOI, the masks, uh, you know, depending on the nodes, they can be uh, bigger. You know, sometimes maybe only 20% bigger, but sometimes 20 double, depending on the lithography. But at the same lithography, maybe it's a little bit more expensive in terms of the masks. You've got the, the buried oxide layer and so forth. And then volume in terms of cost per millimeter square. If CMOS is X, then by CMOS, the wafers are also a pretty similar price at the moment in terms of per area. The RFS and Y wafers are a bit more expensive at the moment. And then if we take relative dye area, if I do a chip in CMOS and same lithography in R, uh, SOI CMOS, if they're the same size, but in by CMOS, the, the silicon germanium transistors are bigger than CMOS. Uh, the logic is normally not as dense, so it's a bigger area. So the, the, the cost in the end is the product of these two. It's the cost for the per, per millimeter square times the area. So in this case, it's like one and a half X squared. Uh, the, 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 the baseline is X squared, and IFSY is a little bit more expensive. 1.3x squared. So if you bear that in mind, I'll come back to that when we talk about the technology side. So what we can do, we can design an NLA. So this is low noise amplifier in three technologies. And we use a similar topology in each one. It's a three stage cascaded common source amplifiers uh, in cascade, operation at 20 gigahertz. And then we include the real lossy components of inductors and balance and matching and all these kind of things you need to do to design these circuits. And we do a kind of benchmarking here. And so we benchmark CMOS, that's the kind of cheapest. And we can see actually we can get better performance with silicon germanium and uh, SOI, CMOS SOI. So you know, maybe it's half a dB improvement in noise figure. So that's a kind of worth having. Now, how does that translate in cost? So if we have half a dB improvement in noise figure, that actually uh, makes the array size half a dB worse noise figure, sorry, for CMOS. That actually makes the array size about 15% bigger. So we'll be burning maybe 15% more power. But if we go back to the previous slide, you know, we're trying to reconcile maybe 30 or 40%. So actually CMOS is probably okay, although its performance is not quite as good. It's probably the best price point still for performance to receive. And then if we look at the PA side, the transmit side, uh, we did the same analysis here. We've done a, a, a SIGI, a CMOS and a CMOS SOI PA. It's operating at low voltage because we're trying to do low power. So in this case, the signal domain, you can't really benefit from, normally that needs a higher VDD to benefit a bit more. But in topology, we're using a dual path neutralized class AB design. So we've got a, a first amplifier, and then we have two paths running in parallel to drive the final load. And then we do that design in those three technologies. There's a, uh, it's, a, it's a neutralized, there's a bit of capacitance feedback around this final amplifier. Again, we see that CMOS is the worst performing. To get kind of 11 dBm in this kind of uh, test case and trying to match it in the other technologies, we can do that with lower power in the other technologies. So the PA is taking at least 10% more power in CMOS. Or conversely, you can say for the same power, it's maybe half a dB, a dB lower. But you know, if it was half a dB lower per element, that translates to about 11% in terms of ERIP. So it's worse performing, but it's not really worse performing to the extent that you'd probably want to spend more on something more exotic in terms of technology. So based on this kind of uh, analysis for our particular circuits in our circumstance, you know, we're designing a 30 gigahertz and our parameters that we had to meet, we went for CMOS. So here's our chip. It's a standard CMOS technology. Um, we actually managed to measure the noise figure per, uh, uh, per receive path, which is RF path, that's the LNA phase shifter and combiner, about 3 dB. Uh, each transmitter, in, again, it's the phase shifter and PA, it's at 8 dBm. Uh, there's five bit phase shifters in each one of those paths. Uh, and that gives us about a one picosecond phase con uh, timing control on, on transmit, for example. Uh, we've got a RF fine gain control as well. Signal bandwidths in terms of modulation, we can handle instantaneously 500 megahertz. And we've got a very low power per, per RF path for receive and transmit. And it's a very small size. It's three millimeters by three millimeters. So 3.3 by 3.3. And the antenna spacing is at 30 gigahertz, so around this kind of number. So you can't really afford anything bigger than that, otherwise it would just wouldn't fit the array. So how we implement, I'll talk a bit about the implementation of the LNA and PAs that we kind of topologies we did. How do we do the phase shifter? That's the bit that's given us the beam forming. So I mentioned before, normally that's a time delay you're trying to do. So if we tab this uh, picture that we showed previously, and we're trying to reconcile that time delay, and that's the delay that we want in time. And it's gotta be, we want the same delay independent of what frequency is coming in. That's that blue line. If we translate that blue line now into, into a phase graph against frequency, it's actually translates this linear phase shift. And actually, we, we want a specific phase at a particular frequency. 
And so what we do is we generate a phase shift using a phase shifter, and that's generated as a constant line. That's the red line. And if we can make that constant line match the signal, which is here, then we can do the time delay with a phase shift. And that's only true if you have a narrowband system. But since we're whopping in millimeter wave, the carrier's at 20 and 30 gigahertz, and the signal bandwidths are 500 megahertz. You know, the, the, the fractional bandwidths are like 3%. So you know, this is a really good way of doing it for our implementation. So how do we do that in practice? We kind of use what we call a vector modulator. So we take the signal coming in, we split into I and Q phases. In, and you can see it in the phase diagram here. So we split into I and Q, then we weight them at different weights. We can get an arbitrary angle of theta by doing the weighting. And in this case here, we take the signal in, we go to two variable gain amplifiers, we have a DAC that controls the weighting. We combine them back together again, and we get the angle that we want to, we want to, we want to delay the RF by. And that's equivalent to adding a time delay, as I mentioned before. So this is it in terms of a bit more detailed implementation. So what we're showing here is we've got the phase error of the uh, phase shifter. And what we do is we kind of calibrate our phase shifter at 18 gigahertz, um, in this case for a LEO operation. And then as you kind of uh, deviate away from the frequency operation, you can see the phase error starts increasing for a fixed uh, calibration point. And that fixed calibration point is at production, not in, in the field, it's just once, and that's it. So that gives you that here. Again, if we're trying now to look at geo, we have this, uh, we take the same silicon, we give it a different calibration point at 20 gigahertz. And then over geo frequency band, it has about a two degree error as the frequency deviates away from the calibration point. So across the whole of the 17 to 20 giga, 21 gigahertz band, we, we get less than three degrees error. So, and we've got a five bit phase shifter, so the LSB is like 11.25 degrees. So this is perfectly good for what we're trying to achieve. And if we translate these kind of phase errors um, in actually inserted phase against frequency, the, the red one is here. So 18 gigahertz, that's the kind of lines of phase. We want these to all be 11 degrees apart. And you can see it's much flatter in the gaps here than it is out here. And then on this geo part here at 20 gigahertz, again, it's the flat section here. As we do do the phase shift uh, with the vector modulator phase shifter, we do generate some gain errors as we go around, and that's shown here. But the RMS gain errors are less than half a dB. Again, if we do the same thing on transmit, this is now at 27 gigahertz to 30 gigahertz. The LEO band is at 20 gig gigahertz. We, we calibrate at this point. We do another calibration at this point. So across the whole frequency band, we can get less than three degrees again. And then the, that's associated again with a less than half a dB RMS uh, gain error in the phase shifter. So this is the dye photograph. Um, uh, this is the silicon on side. It's like, as I said, 3.3 by 3.3. This is it on uh, X-ray on the PCB. So you can see the circles of the bumps. And this is the uh, first virus of the PCB as it goes down to the antenna. So this is an automotive design, as I mentioned before. So reliability is important. And it's CMOS. So you know CMOS uh, transistors uh, have a reliability uh, thing that you need to keep an eye on. It's They, they follow the classical bathtub uh, failure rate, which is, the, I picked this from Wikipedia. So the wear out failures, you know, they, they happen, you know, in, and this is a CMOS technology, they happen due to device aging, because hot carry injection, uh, bias temperature instability and electro migration. And in our design, because we've got CMOS, we've got thin oxide transistors operating from a one volt power supply only. So that's really important that we keep an eye on this kind of reliability. So all of these phenomena that I mentioned here, they're very dependent on voltage and temperature. So it's really important that we actually model the uh, device temperature and also look at, look at the stress that we put the devices under as they're used in the field. So this is in addition to the, obviously the normal simulations you do for RF analog design over process voltage temperature in Monte Carlo and all these kind of things. This is an additional thing to do for automotive in particular. So the first thing is we've got to work out what the temperature is. So what we do is we, we take the die and that's the die there. Uh, we put it on the PCB, we load the PCB information, we put the bumping information in, we put the, the underfill information. We then add all the power sources in the simulation. So in this case, we ship a full uh, frequency division duplex at arcs and ticks on at the same time, put all the receivers and all the transmitters on. And you see this is the dye thermal map. You see the red parts are showing the PAs and there's some red parts on this side showing the LNAs. And then we put it into a simulation to predict what the temperature is going to be. In this case, we're using Keysight, that's a thermal simulation. So if we do this now um, 
you know, at temperature ambient 85 degrees, you know, which is our worst case uh, situation. And as I said, we use the worst case power, full uh, frequency division duplex. So I'm using FF silicon, that's fast process silicon. Then we can see the PA devices, they're sticking up here. They're 20 degrees hotter than the ambient. So they go up by 20 degrees. In typical silicon, it's more like 15 degrees. So we've got an indirect temperature monitor on our chip as well. And in that section, it reckons that typically that would go up 13 degrees. And the indirect temperature monitor is about there, where the more up at the marker. And then critically, the boundary to the next uh, IFRC tile, because you know this chip will sit next to another chip, will sit next to another chip. That boundary edge goes up about three degrees. So from that, we can predict how big, the, how hot the array will get uh, as the panel. The other things we can see in the simulation is we can see that the VDD and VSS for which we have about 50, you know, 30 odd excess VSS bumps, you know, they, they show a lower temperature because they act as thermal bumps. So they're one way of dissipating the heat from the chip to the PCB. So then we did the reliability simulations, as I mentioned. So it's uh, 40 nanometer CMOS is what we've done. It's an automotive qualified process and it, it allows us to do aged models. So what that means is um, using Cadence Bell Expert, we first simulate the stress of the transistors, and from that stress of the VDD, VS, VDS swings on the PAs, for example, we generate an aged model. And then in, in this case, the maximum VDS occurs in the PA at close to, very, at close to zero current in the device. So the dominant device degradation mechanism is non-conducting hot carry injection, which is significantly less severe on lifetime than hot carry injection when it's conducting which is normally the case when you have uh, inverters and, and logic and things like that. So from that, that's modeled in, it's, it's all modeled in the, in the process technology. So once we've got those aged models from the stress simulation, we then s simulate as if it's been, uh, transistors have been aged by 10 years at 100 degrees junction. And from that, we see that the PA output power after this uh, lifetime in the field, it only goes down by about half a dB compared to the fresh silicon. And we've seen that in our lab, you know, we put the chips in our lab, we put them in the oven for accelerated and then we come and measure them afterwards and we haven't, we can't see the measurement change really. It's uh, pretty good. So in terms of noise figure, um, this graph shows noise figure that we've measured of our chip. Um, you know, we wanted to get uh, about three and a half dB including the mixers or about 3.3 dB without the mixer. So the, the continuous lines show without the mixer. So that's the LNA, the phase shift and combiner. And this is four paths on a, on a single chip. Actually, this is the first chip that we measured. It's probably one of the worst ones we measured, actually. <laughs> Subsequently, we got better data. But um, so we see the noise figure at 18 gigahertz for the kind of LNA phase shifters combined is about just under 3.5. At 20 gigahertz, it's more like 3 dB. When we combine four of these, these four channels together, of course, then we get the kind of beam forming or we get the, uh, the phased array gain. And we actually measured, you know, we get the 6 dB improvement in SNR. So we measured on the bench you know, effectively like a 2.5 dB noise figure. So from three and a half, from three point um, three or something, we go to just below two point five minus two point five dB. So that shows the the combining working. And that's obviously when we combine them constructively, the signals. So this table just shows across a number of samples. The average noise figure, single sideband, including the mixers and the IF, is about three and a half dB. Slightly better at twenty gigahertz. It's slightly better noise match that we got on our in our application. But in terms of the beamforming part that you, the noise figure you care about, it's about three point three dB to three dB. Uh, so in terms of gain and bandwidth, you know, this curve shows the gain of the receiver as we switch the low frequency. So this is including the down conversion and the baseband mixers and IF. So as you switch switch the LO frequency across the whole frequency band from 17 to 20 gigahertz, you can get this shape. Each one of these shapes is the IF filter, effectively. So if we look, if we take one of these shapes and zoom in on it, you know, this is effectively a 650 megahertz bandwidth, which is due to the 325 megahertz. IQ bandwidth in the filters that we have. And we can program them filters, of course. So we can program the bandwidth narrower and narrower so we can make it more selective. And this is, sorry, this is measurement results again. Again, measurement results of the phase shifter. So again, we've got a phase setting that we set from you know, zero to 32 to tra traverse uh, 360 degrees. We're trying to get 11.25 degree per step. And yeah, we get it within a quarter of an LSD each time at 20 gigahertz. If we do the same thing on transmit at 30 gig, at 29.7 gigahertz, again, it's within a quarter of an LSP. And this is all over, over voltage, process, and temperature. So this is between one, one volt and 2.1265 volt, minus 40 degrees and 85 degrees. They're all the different curves. This is the phase characteristic. As we step through the phase, obviously the, the gain of the phase shift changes slightly, but it's, whatever it is, it's very deterministic. So every time we dial in, let's say that phase setting, 
So let's say one, two, three lots of 11.25 degrees, we know the gain is going to be one dB high. So what we do is in, in calibration and lookup tables, we correct for that. So that as you steer the beam, you can change the gain and then you can make sure that the beam pattern, you know, the weighting on the on the element stays the same. Transmit now, um, transmit again between 27 and 30 gigahertz. The blue line shows we can get 10 dBm across the whole frequency. The, the red triangles show power consumption per element. So we're about 100 milliwatts per element. When I say element, I mean splitter, phase shifter and PA. So this slide shows the um, phase shift on transmit. I showed it before, but this is a bit more, this is now where we take the phase shifter. Um, the phase shift on trans transmit is a bit more difficult because it operates live signal. So the signals going through it are swinging a lot. And what we what don't want to happen is when the signals are big or small, depending on how much gain you put in, you don't want the phase shift to change based on the instantaneous signal that's going through. On receive, that doesn't happen because on a satellite receiver, the signals that you receive are always very small. So there's no linearity uh, concern. So in this case, what we've got, we've got, uh, the, again, the phase error against the phase shift that we're trying to achieve. We want to be at zero. Again, typically it's kind of like plus or minus two degrees against different channels at different frequencies. Again, this is all with a fixed calibration table. So there's no calibration between samples, same calibration table. And then this is operating where we calibrated at near OP1 dB, near the, sat near the compression point of the transmitter. And now in this case, what we do is we take the signals that we're transmitting, we reduce them by 12 dB. And then we look at the phase shift again and see, has it changed the phase shift? So it has the beam pointed in a different direction? And it's a very small error. It's less than one degree shift. So that's perfectly acceptable for our performance that we're trying to achieve. And in doing that, obviously, we look at the amplitude each time. And the amplitude, again, follows a very same characteristic. In, in fact, you couldn't tell the difference depending on the signal level. So that shows our phase shift is very robust in the field. So then we can do modulation measurements. So this is modulated measurements at 28.2 gigahertz. In this case, we're 8 PSK. I think it's running at 4.5 mega symbols per second. We've got the EVM at kind of like minus 28.6 dB for one channel, uh, transmitting at about 7 dBm. The ACPR, uh, the adjacent channel, uh, that we power protection ratio is 37 dB down. So we've got a pretty uh, nice spectrum. Again, now if we take this single channel on this chip and then we enable all the other three channels and put the phase shifters in a line, then the power goes up by about 12 dB. It's not exactly 12 dB in this case because we didn't calibrate for the uh, errors in the delays in the uh, in the test fixture. But you, you can see the phase, the, the beam forming occur. The EVM does degrade slightly and the ACPR does degrade slightly, but that's only due to the worst of the four channels that we're combining, not due to any combining effect. Now, if we run that into uh, maximum smoke, so we put the, each of these PAs now at 10 dBm, then we and we get the 12 dB gain, we add all four together, we measure 21 point, was it 21.7 dBm, uh, ERIP. Um, the EVM is now uh, now degraded. You can see it's close to quite big because the PAs are running non uh, kind of beyond output compression and the ACPR therefore the spectral regrowth has got worse but it's still 20 dBc so plenty for QPSK or 8PSK modulations and this is all without any crest factor reduction or DPD in the baseband so if you have DPD added to this you can improve this significantly so then we talked a lot about dye temperature so what we did is in this graph we've got uh, we've got temperature against different mode of operation of the chip so in the first mode we had the, just the temperature sensor only, so there's no power consumption in the chip. And then we read back what the temperature is the, of the sensor on the chip says. And we read it back against what the ambient temperature is in the oven. So when we set the ambient temperature to minus 40, we expect to read minus 40. We actually read minus 44. So we've got a slight offset in our temperature sensor. But what we do now is we progressively switch on more blocks, switch on, switch on one receiver, switch on four receivers, switch on the transmitter. And by the end, we switched on four receivers, four transmitters, all on at the same time. And we measure the delta and temperature. And if you remember back on, in our simulation, we predicted 13 degrees. On average, across our samples, we've been seeing about 12.3. So it's a really good validation of our thermal modeling using that, um, that model that we built in the design phase. So then we have uh, power consumption. So four receivers at maximum gain for this chip. You know, it's this is the power wheel, if you like, and 75% of it is in the LNA and phase shifters. So that's the RF paths. Then we've got bit in the baseband and the mixers and the yellow daisy chaining and the yellow generation. And then they transmit at four transmitters at 10 dBm each. So that's 22 dBm when combined. You know, 85% of each chip is taken up by the PA, the phase shifter, and the splitter, as you'd expect. And then only a small portion for the baseband sections and the IQ modulator. 
So in summary, uh, I mean, our chip here, we compare it to you know, com state-of-the-art comparison with uh, published works in uh, general solid-state circuits, RFIC symposium, and, and things like that uh, from other companies. And the key thing to note, you know, we've done it in CMOS. You know, these guys did it in BICMOS. Other guys have done it in CMOS as well, so we're not alone. Most of the published works for 5G at 28 gigahertz, but you know, some are satellite situations. But even at the slightly different frequency, we can compare noise figures. You know, our noise figures are pretty good on receive compared to the comp uh, before, compared to the published works. We've got the phase shifter in there. You know, not quite as good as this one, but you know, better than these guys, which don't have phase shifters at all. Output power, we can do 10 dBm, which is what we need. The EVM is perfectly decent for the kind of low modulations that we're trying to achieve on the transmit side. The key benefit is the power consumption. If you look at per RF path, that's per LNA phase shift and combiner, we're less than 40 milliwatts compared to these guys at 130, 50. So that really is the key benefit. And on transmit, it's the same. If we've got 100 milliwatts for 10 dBm, these guys are 200 milliwatts. So, you know, really we've managed to achieve very low power in this CMOS technology. So in conclusion, what I've kind of talked about, I've talked about why we're doing what we're doing and what we've come up with as a solution to enable this work. We've we've come up with a 4RX, 4TX KA band transceiver in 49 meter CMOS. The noise figure and the, of the LNA and 5-bit phase shifters is about 3 dB. And the transmit side, we've got the RFPA and the 5-bit phase shifter can transmit up to 10 dBm. We've included all the IQ fixed down conversion, baseband, um, you know, LO generation, monitoring of the chip and all that kind of thing and digital all included. So by doing that at low power, we managed to uh, uh, you know, enable basically automotive K band phased away antennas. So I think that's the kind of long and short of what we've been doing. And what I want to share is a collaboration between a uh, kind of UK research industry project that wants commercial partners like ourselves to generate technology that can enable the next level of uh, the technology providers in the UK for the automotive industry to make sure satellite can happen in cars. So here's some references. Thank you for listening. Hope I was okay for time there, Ricardo. Thank you very much for a very nice, interesting talk. So we are open for questions now. So if you have any question, please write it in the YouTube channel. Then you can read it to Alan. Uh, so I'm seeing no question for the moment. So, but I have one, uh, Alan. Um, uh, as you are doing chips for critical applications, are you also considering uh, uh, techniques to cope with the radiation effects? Yes, for this for this particular chip, it's, it's, it's earth-based, so it's ground-based, so we, we don't have to concern ourselves with that. But in 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 our work in in silica, we have looked that we are doing some chips that will go in payload, so that's going into the satellite. So looking at hardening is something that we are familiar with. Um, for it's unfortunately most of the published works are kind of older technologies, planar technologies, uh, uh, maybe 65 nanometer and above, and the and the the things you're trying to achieve, are, you know, in the digital you've got redundancy and the mechanism in the analog and the RF, you know, you've got to stop latch up from happening. So that's more to do with layout design techniques. Um, mm. Doing latch up guard rings not just on the IOs of chips but inside the chip. It's making sure you split NMOS and PMOS far apart so that latch up uh, mechanisms can occur. But also, if it was going in payload, then maybe technology would be a choice. Maybe we choose a, an SOI technology, which is has less susceptibility to radiation effects, or even a silicon germanium technology. So yeah, I think in that aspect, there's a lot of area, some literature, but it's hard to prove until you make it and then you, you hit it <laughs> for a long time, and then you kind mm -hmm. of get your results and see how your RF is degraded. I think on digital, as I said, memories and stuff, it's redundancy. You can detect those things. In the analog, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a slow degradation. So it's a little bit harder to determine. OK. So I see a question by Caleb Conceição, uh, here from the Federal Institute of Technology uh, near Porto Alegre. Uh, so thanks for the talk. Uh, good to know uh, that in silica is coming to Porto Alegre. What are the main soft skills expect of candidates willing to be part of in silica team? Yes, so I, I, I will pass that on to my uh, colleague Julio after this, who will explain all about Insilica in Porto Alegre. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, I haven't had a chance to visit, but uh, I would hope to visit in the future. But if that's okay, I can pass that on to uh, uh, Julio next, if that's okay, Ricardo. Okay, so after Julio's presentation, he can uh, talk.
talk about this issue also. So, uh, but uh, also considering the radiation effects, uh, if you are using a nano CMOS uh, technology nowadays, even the ground is uh, sensible to some radiation. Yes, I think on this in this case also this die the way that we're using it it's, it's bumped directly to the to the it's a wafer level chip scale package, so there's no there's no plastic on it, so we do have to consider it very carefully. So again, the latch with the latch up kind of guidelines, we follow them for an automotive. So we follow all the recommended guidelines for extra spacings for all these wells. We have loads of redundant grounds, so yes, we have to be very uh, pay the careful attention to it, but. It's difficult to prove what you've done actually makes a difference until mm. you test. So I think that's where the kind of proving the science mm. is, is, is difficult. Yeah. Just by curiosity, I, maybe you don't know, uh, we have some works here in universe related to uh, techniques to cope with radiation effects. And uh, we have uh, uh, some few chips that uh, are embedded in a nano satellite. So one was launched uh, about uh, six years ago, six, seven now, and uh, it's still running. So when the satellite crosses over our state, there is an antenna in the National uh, Institute for Space Research, uh, 300 kilometers from Porto Alegre. And then they, and, and, and uh, once uh, there was one week that uh, there was no signal from the nano satellite. And then uh, later we saw that uh, there was a huge uh, uh, solar activity. And then after this week, uh, the circuit recovered themselves and start running again. And they are running till now. And, uh, and uh, a few months ago, it was launched a second satellite also with uh, a chip design here in our university and another one designed in the Purdue University of Santa Maria that is a city uh, a little bit less than 300 kilometers from Porto Alegre. They have also a microelectronics group there. And uh, so uh, this is- yeah, uh, I, think, I think the payloads are very difficult. And they've got, yeah. they've got to be up there. They've got to last a long, long time. They've got to self-fix. You know, I, I think I mentioned before when I when I was researching for this uh, presentation earlier, I was, you know, there's 7,300 satellites up there now. There's 11,000 been launched. Those are the 4,000 failed, basically, you know. Or well, some of them were designed to, to drop out of orbit, but a number of them also failed. And it's obviously not easy to fix when they're up there. Uh, I think that the electronics that go in these things, you know, I talked about uh, reliability in automotive. Obviously, the you know, satellite is even is next level up. Yeah. So thank you very much, Alan. I'm not seeing any question here in the chat. So maybe we can go to the presentation of Julio. And then after his presentation, uh, uh, people can uh, still do questions for you and for Julio, no? Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Ricardo. So, Julio, can you can you put your uh, share your slides? So, um, so Julio Leão uh, is the Brazil Design Center director here at Porto Alegre. Uh, so, uh, Julio has a postdoctorate at UC Berkeley in USA in 2001. Uh, he has done a PhD at IMAC in uh, Leuven, Belgium in 99. He's a master in computer science and, uh, and also he has done the undergrad in electrical engineering, both at the uh, Purdue University of Rio Grande do Sul, 89 and, and 86. And he worked at Get to Ship and Forty, so two uh, EDA companies uh, based in USA that both were acquired by Cadence. And he also worked with NSCAD that uh, was based in the uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul and also at SATEC here in Porto Alegre. His roles include the project management, digital design methodologies for RTL, GDS2, EDA software development, digital IC design, technical specification definition, feasibility analysis, system and technology adoption, uh, procedures definitions. So thank you, Julie, to uh, 
accept to give uh, this uh, short presentation of the uh, arrival of in silica in Brazil. So we are very happy that uh, we have now in silica in Brazil and especially here in Porto Alegre that is becoming the allocation with uh, several microelectronics company now. So it's great that in silica is join this uh, location to and i'm sure that uh, in silica here will be able to get uh, very nice uh, people to work with uh, in silica no? so julio the floor is with you thank you very much Hayes, for the opportunity to present in silica here thank you alan for the nice technical talk i will be very short just an overview about what in silica is all about and how uh, in silica arrived in Brazil and what's the most important, what's the plans for growth in Brazil. So in silica is a fabulous ASIC supplier. So we design and supply digital and mixed signal ASICs. The company was founded in 2001, so it's 20 years old. Uh, it has approximately 150 engineers, including uh, permanent staff and contractors. Most of more than 10% with PhDs. Headquarters is in Oxford. It has another two offices in, in England, uh, a subsidiary in, in, sorry, another two offices in England and a subsidiary in India. And it's starting in Brazil. And I'll talk this uh, by the end of this slides. Uh, Encidica has received some recognition about their growth and innovation that I leave here for people to read later. And the main uh, vision of Encidica is Encidica is committed to deliver in-time projects with high quality. So the quality of the work and the deliverable in time is very important to Encidica. So just in one slide, so you have a, a, an idea of the history of Encilica with some milestones, I will mention just three or four. It was founded in 2001 by three digital uh, designers. Uh, one of them is still uh, Encilica CEOs right now. Uh, if you look here in 2012, Encilica opened its subsidiary in India Today, they have about 35 people in India working there. In 2016, uh, Alan and his analog team joined in Silica. So he is, he's, here is in 16. In 2020, another analog team joined in Silica, a team from Sheffield. In 2021, uh, the Brazil team is joining in Silica. I, I mentioned some partners of Encilica here in the bottom, and you can see some conductors companies from design, uh, fabrication, and, uh, and NEDA. Uh, the main markets that Encilica targets its products are automotive, industrial and healthcare, communications and hardware, IoT and consumer. I also leave this slide here for people to read about some of the products that uh, Encilica has developed uh, on this area, but I'm not going to into details now. To do these products and designs, Encilica goes from system level architecture down to silicon validation and qualification of its products, both in the digital side here in the left and analog side through all phases of the design from specification to supply. In order to, to achieve these capabilities, Encilica has uh, best in class EDA tools. We, you can see in this slide, Encilica has Mentor, Cadence, Synopsis, just to mention a few of the companies Encilica has uh, softwares for, it, for its designers. So how uh, Encilica arrived in Brazil? As you all know, SATEC is being extinguished uh, by the government and, and a group of engineers from SATEC, from the design center from SATEC, instead of uh, moving abroad and working in other countries, they decided to prepare a presentation about the capabilities of the SATEC design team. 
and we submitted this presentation up to about 60 companies all over the world. And two of these companies decided to open subsidiaries in Brazil. Uh, both of them are going to open in Porto Alegre, and one of them is in Silica. And Silica was, was the first one, and 12 engineers, uh, all from SATEC, uh, have been hired by Encilica starting last uh, month. Uh, I started 1st of June, it was the first one, and all the rest, all the other 11 started uh, by the end of June. We have in this team 10 digital design and verification engineers, two analog designers, and, and mixed signal designers. So, uh, the Encilica decided to, to move here because they and they interviewed all these guys and they see that the flows that we use to do project, the, the procedures that we have to management, manage projects, both digital and analog, the accreditation for ISO 9001 that we had at the SATEC uh, showed that we had a strong team here. So, but this is only the start. So we start with 12 in the next slide, I will show the, what we, we are planning. Uh, and Silica is going to open its office if uh, uh, COVID allows and if we can get everything in time by October 1st. Uh, the office is going to be at Technopook. We are going to have uh, an intern program for two or three interns per year, each one with a local mentor uh, at, in the company. We want to have a, a, a straight communication with local universities. Uh, this is not new for Encilica, it's a policy of Encilica. Uh, in England, it's like that. They have connections and links with uh, universities there also. Uh, a few weeks ago, we, we submitted a press release for the media, so there is some information about that also in this press release. Uh, the office we, we are moving in has enough space for 28 designers, so we have 12, so we have uh, openings. Right now, uh, we we are looking some for, for some digital design and verification engineers, but we also intend to, to broaden a little bit to have more analog designers, uh, physical designers, the FT, and, and others, like I mentioned in this slide. And if uh, you are interested in, in coming to, to Encilica in Brazil and work with us uh, in the Encilica site where I put the link there. Uh, there is a section for, for opportunities in Brazil. Right now there are, I think, only five job specifications. Uh, but uh, even if, if you, are, um, you are not in that job specifications, you are a junior or you are an analog designer. I don't have a job specification for analog designers yet there. You can submit your CV for this email right there, careersbrazil at Encilica. And we will be looking at uh, all the resumes we are receiving and we'll be giving feedback for everyone. Thank you, Reis. Thank you, Julio. So maybe you can start, uh, well, before starting the question, so just to remind uh, everyone that you can do your question using the chat channel. Please, uh, if you have any questions, do write it as soon as possible. So first we can come back to the question by Kalebi. So uh, about uh, what are the main soft skills expect of candidates willing to be part of Insilica team? Yeah, uh, soft skills that we require uh, is rel are greatly related with communication. Uh, communication is uh, very important, uh, mainly because we have teams in different uh, countries. The team in Brazil is not working alone in a single project. We are part of a bigger team and we have meetings every day with uh, people not only from English, England, but also from France. And so to, to communicate is a, a soft skill that's very important. And of course, there is the barrier of the language, but even 
it's the language and the distance together that uh, uh, are difficult in the beginning. I know that people who work in, in the areas of semiconductors here in Brazil, they are all used to write and read in English, but when it comes to have meetings every day, uh, it, it complicates a little bit. So it's communication is important. Yeah, maybe I can add something to this question is uh, what is more important for you, the technical skills or the software ones? I think it, you need to have both, uh, Hayes. Yes. Uh, if, you, if you are a very smart guy, but you, no one by himself can do a project alone. So you have to communicate to several people to, to, to have a ship working at the end. So you need to have both. Yeah, okay. I agree. So I another that, question by yeah. Claudio Diniz. Thank you for the nice talks and welcome in Silica to Porto Alegre, Brazil. So Claudio Diniz is a professor here at the Federal University of uh, Rio Grande do Sul. So the question is, what will be the focus of the Porto Alegre team? Uh, you see, uh, the team in Porto Alegre has worked a lot of years doing RFIDs at CETEC. But to, we, we have proved through the interviews that uh, the skills and the background this team has is enough to work in projects that are not RFIDs related, like in Silica Works. So what I can tell you that uh, uh, the, these 12 people that just uh, joined in Silica, more than half of the team are already working and, and they, they are there for three weeks only. So they are already working on a project that is related to communications and applications in, in space. But that doesn't mean that uh, we will be doing this always. This is the first project that I have seven people working on this project already. Uh, there are two guys that our analog the designers, they, they are talking to Alan to decide the project that they are going to work. I don't know if Alan has already decided on that. Maybe he can mention about yeah, one, one that. Of the guy, yeah, one of the guys is already working on um, a medical chip, a medical diagnostic chip. And the other guy is helping us on our analog flow. And I flow, so yes, um, we've we've utilized them. Yeah. Good. So I see no more questions. If you still have one, you can do it uh, very very quickly. So, uh, but uh, so it's great uh, to to have in Silica here in Porto Alegre. I wish you all uh, great success. And um, so. Uh, the distance, uh, yes, Julio? Yeah, I would like to mention just one more thing. You see that uh, we know that the software industry is attracting a lot of people recently. And, and the globalization with companies from US hiring people directly, just leaving the, the undergrad course here, uh, it, uh, it gets a little bit difficult to, to get more people interested in semiconductor semiconductors, but uh, I think the universities and together with the companies that are arriving here, we should go to the science and technology go, uh, ministry and, and talk there that it's important to grow this industry and, and use the opportunity that we have now that we have two companies that are starting in Porto Alegre and they both companies have plans to grow. We, uh, we need to have more people in the semiconductor area to to enable these people these companies to grow so yeah when we are in bad, yeah. when we are in bad times like we are now with uh, the government we have these days uh, it's time also to prepare for the future no so yeah. at worst we still have a one and a half year with uh, and we hope that uh, the next government will uh, consider again to support uh, the science and technology education and uh, so when we arrive to new times we have to be prepared also to on the other hand uh, it's not so bad the situation considering this because uh, 
in the undergrad uh, that uh, we are going to start uh, the semester uh, next uh, August 2. Uh, I have uh, 44 students uh, in uh, integrated circuit design. Uh, so uh, maybe can also prepare a presentation for them also. There is one more question. Maybe Alan could answer. I don't know the answer. Yes, the next question by Tassiano Rodolfo from uh, Catholic University at Porto Alegre. Does in silica employ devices such as FPGAs in its products? Yes. So the, in our end customer products, some of them are FPGAs. But because we're a semi little company, generally we use our FPGAs internal developments for prototyping our ASICs, improving our algorithms. So um, yes, is the question. We, we, do, we do that. So, but you use uh, mainly to prototype. Uh... Yeah, for for, our, for our most for internal developments, yes, for prototypes. But yeah. some customer products are actually yeah. FPGAs, and they just want us to configure them to do a particular function. So, in that case, then those products are FPGAs. But it, you know, obviously, FPGAs are quite expensive, and so it's normally very low volume, but high value. But in in chip terms, we tend to focus more on high volume, low cost. So um, yeah, for our developments, it's mostly Xilinx platforms for development and proving our ASICs are going to work. Yeah. In any high volume, uh, ASICs are much less expensive than FPGAs. No? <laughs> so we are going to see more and more ASICs no? also to cope with uh, reliability and power no? consumption reduction. So uh, I see no more questions. So thank you very much, Alan and Julio, to accept our invitation. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye. No, bye, bye. bye.